so whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. So we are in the middle, basically, of a period of time during which, if you look at the past, there's 45 years of AR research that we actually have behind us. This is a picture from work by Ivan Sutherland, late 1960s, early 70s. This is the first see-through stereoscopic head-worn display uh, tracked by ultrasonic and as well also um, mechanical trackers uh, 45 years ago. Um, we've had 16 years of research on mobile AR, not with smartphones, of course, not with uh, nice little handhelds, uh, but with a ridiculous looking backpack that you're seeing a version of at the bottom over there. So my group went out in 1996 with 45 pounds worth of stuff in our back. That's actually a second generation one at the lower left. That was more like maybe 30 pounds. Um, so lots of stuff where we overlay things on your field of view, optical see-through displays, uh, models of buildings in the world around us. And, you know, people have been doing this for a long time now. So one interesting question then, uh, or a series of questions, which I'm going to ask of you. So what I'd like you to do is to raise your hand if you've ever used a mobile AR app. They're all ringers. It's wonderful. Okay. Keep your hands. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Up in the air. Wave them around. Okay. So keep it up if you have more than one or even one or more mobile AR app on your smartphone right now. You have to put your hand down if you don't have that. Okay. So some hands are going down. Not a lot. This is the best audience for this. Okay. So um, how many of you, keep your hand up, if you use a smartphone mobile AR app at least once a day? And it, uh, <laughs> there's still some hands up. Okay, this is good. This is good. At least once a day. Now, keep your hands up if you don't work for or with the company that actually makes the app. Are there any hands still up? <laughs> you really use this more than you know, at least once a day. Okay, cool. Which app? Out of curiosity. Um, uh, combination of Yelp and denial. Uh huh. Interesting. Okay, but. Yeah, but notice that there's not a lot of hands up in the air, okay? And, and this is ARE, so we would expect the max full number over here. So why is this? So I think uh, maybe many of us know the reasons already, but I'll just repeat them. One of them, of course, is the tracking really, really sucks, okay? So that red thing is where the smartphone actually is, and those yellow pins over a period of not too many hours are where, courtesy of GPS, uh, not being as accurate as you'd like it to be, the system is telling you that it thinks that it is, okay? 1999, our backpack, which was using strictly off-the-shelf stuff, although admittedly a fairly expensive shelf, real-time kinematic, uh, global navigation, satellite tracking, we were using GPS and GLONASS, hybrid inertial trackers, courtesy of Eric Foxland's company, um, and this stuff just dominates what's in a 2012 smartphone. On the other hand, the amount of money we paid for those things back then dominates, and sadly, Many of those technologies, especially the, the RTK, have come down in price, but not quite anywhere near the order of magnitude of what it costs to go and buy a smartphone. So there's a way of doing some of this stuff better, okay, but not as good as you'd like it to be. Um, and, you know, this has been known for a long time and been used for folks for a very long time. And maybe we'll see some of this coming into smartphones, but I think we can do even better than that. And I'll talk a little bit more of that towards the end of the talk. Uh, another issue is the, the field of view that we're talking about. So if you actually look at uh, the world, you know, here's just a view, Times Square. Um, here's our little view of where our smartphone is being held up. And what you're going to see in there, of course, is not this perfect little frame with the world inside of it, like sometimes you'll see in some AR app ads. What you'll really see is something more like this, okay? The field of view isn't actually mapping and matching. And of course, that can make things really confusing if you're trying to correlate the stuff you see in the phone with the stuff that you see when you don't hold the phone up, okay? Then on top of this, we have this whole crazy handheld lifestyle, whether it's the uh, older tablet PC that you're seeing in the upper left-hand corner for some work my group did a number of years ago, or the various smartphone apps that people hold with one hand or two hands, uh, landscape mode or portrait mode. Um, you don't want to spend a lot of time walking around with your hand up like this, moving it around, or even two hands up, moving it around, or even two hands or one hand full of stuff when you could be doing other things with your hands, okay? So what's the solution to this? I think the answer is eyewear, 
think a lot of a number of other people here may believe that also. In fact, I know a number of other people here believe that. Um, now, right now, this is a lot of what I use in my group. Um, uh, optical see-through, video see-through. The one at the top over there weighs around a kilogram. It's got a 60-degree diagonal field of view, old-fashioned optics, um, 35,000 uh, bucks worth of optical see-through stereo headwear display. The one at the bottom, obviously, is a lot less expensive, a product from Musix. Um, video see-through, and neither of these, however, weigh what you want them to weigh, look like you want them to look. These are simply not things that folks other than researchers, maybe gamers if they can afford them, would actually be willing to go and wear. I don't think it's going to be this either, okay? Um, with a little teeny tiny display perched off to the side somewhere. You know, that can be very useful for things, but that's not AR. And, you know, it's not just that Google Glass isn't it. It's that the things that Google Glass look exactly like, like the micro-optical clip-on from well over 10 years ago, um, that I think really wasn't it either. So here I think we're getting a little warmer. Um, these are all working prototypes. The one at the top um, is around 10 years old from Minolta before they joined up with Konica to become Konica Minolta. Uh, there's one from Loomis in the middle, Sony at the bottom. Um, there's a number of uh, companies here right now. Uh, Epson, um, I guess music isn't here with a booth. Um, folks at Innovega. Um, um, I'm forgetting the French company. Some will remind me. Yes? Uh, right. Um, so there's a number of companies that have things that are beginning to kind of look like this. Now still, I, when I'm saying getting warmer, this is not what you really want because I think that no one wants to walk around looking like this except a real geek. But the neat thing is I think this is getting close enough that a really talented industrial designer, a Johnny Ive kind of person, could take this kind of set of constraints and make it into something in which the little funny looking things on the side or at the top that look like they were done by engineers, because they were done by engineers, could actually look like they were done by a really talented industrial designer, and people would actually want to wear things, even if they didn't work, that kind of looked like the things that had that really beautiful look, just because it was a real beautiful look. So I think this is going to happen, okay? And happily, I think there's a number of people here who are actually working in the forefront of making the kind of eyewear that is going to make this happen. Um, now, much though I believe that eyewear is a very important part of the solution, I'm not an eyewear bigot in the sense that I don't think that all the other displays in the world are, are going to go away. And one of the things that's very important to me is the idea of combining eyewear with other kinds of displays. For example, um, we're doing some work right now in which we're using admittedly clunky eyewear um, in combination with a Microsoft Surface. So the idea is that other people who are not wearing eyewear can interact with a touch-sensitive surface, interact with it, look at it, see material that's on it. But if you are wearing the eyewear, you can see additional stuff. In this case, we have building footprints that are on the surface, and then we have the building models that are essentially extruded up from the surface, um, being able to be seen beyond the edge of the bezel that they would normally stop at if you were looking just at something on the rear projected surface itself. And so the little video over here um, is just tracking as we're moving the camera around. And so we've got this nice notion of sort of architectural models we can move around and uh, interact with. Um, one of the things that's very important to me is that if we have all of this kind of technology, I think user interface design is a very, very key issue. Um, and you can't just design the way that people designed for current desktops and laptops and, and, and handhelds in which the idea is that when it, the screen is off, it's black, okay? There's nothing there, okay? You own every single pixel. You're responsible for it all. And that's a very liberating feeling. You own everything. You're responsible for what it looks like. Um, in AR, the world is there. You, know, you don't turn everything black. Uh, when the system is off, all the things that normally happen are happening. And when the system is on, all the things that are normally happening are happening. And you need to take that into account. And so when you're designing for AR, you need to respect the real world. You need to know what's out there. You need to avoid overlaying things that are really important. Okay? You need to avoid having stuff that's really important in the real world 
overlay the things that you have and prevent you from seeing the things that you have that you want to show. And that means you need to be understanding of, the system needs to know about what's actually out there. And it's very different from what you do when you're trying to design for that little featureless black rectangle that's sitting in front of you or sitting in front of me for that matter right now. So what about tracking? In the remaining minute or two, I want to say a little bit about um, where I think tracking is going to head. Because I think that in addition to eyewear being very important, I think that being able to know where we are and where we're looking is extremely important as well. There's great work that people are doing right now, um, especially indoors, looking for features in an environment, whether they're features that are in the form of a poster that the system knows about in advance, um, as in systems like Qualcomm Vuforia, whether it's doing what's often called SLAM, simultaneous uh, localization uh, and mapping, in which you're looking in the world around you, looking for features and trying to be able to go and with those features that you're finding, track yourself relative to it, like some of the very nice stuff that, that you were starting to see being done with the PlayStation Vita. Um, those things are great. But we want to do that not just inside, where we're relatively controlled in terms of lighting, but outside, where people are walking around all over the place. There's lots of stuff going on. It's a much more complex world. It gets dark. It gets light. Sometimes it's literally really, really dark. Sometimes it's blinding light outside. So one of the things that impresses me as being a way that this is going to happen is through a kind of collaborative tracking and modeling. So we've got people who want to know where they are, Okay? And they also want to know interesting information, kind of like the sort of interesting information that you might ask Google or Bing or similar other kinds of search engines. And then we might have a system run by folks, of course, uh, with, that wants to model the world. It wants to have models of people and where they are and who they are and all their interesting information, which, of course, should sound like a number of companies that we can think of right now. Um, now imagine having users being able to provide or, and being willing to provide current sensor data, camera imagery if they're wearing cameras, for example, uh, microphone uh, recorded audio if they're wearing uh, microphones, um, their history, again, this should sound like companies that we know of that would be quite happy to go and get your search history and as well all the other things that you're doing online. And again, relevant, interesting information that they'd like an answer to right now. Like, you know, I'm hungry, what's a good place to eat at? So think about the system of being able to go and take that stuff that's being provided to it in real time, the sensor data, the history from the users, and matching this against a database, a very large database. Um, taking camera imagery, for example, and combining that with first guesses from global satellite systems, from IMUs, from other kinds of things, including where you might have been confirmed to be not all that long ago. Then returning to the user very precise current position and orientation, which would be used by their system to be able to go and overlay interesting information. And of course, also returning that interesting information, like you know where the restaurants are and how they're rated and stuff like that. And then taking all that stuff that it got and updating those databases so the databases now have up to the second imagery in them. And it's a funny thing where if I get out of here and get back in again, I think I'll be able to continue. There we go. So who are the users going to be? I think just everyone, just plain folk, not just folks in places like ARE, but just folks all around the world. Who the system going to be? Well, it's the usual suspects, to quote a rather well-known movie. Uh, I think it's a, a, well, a beautifully sinister picture of an older version of one of the usual suspects, uh, camera-mounted uh, cameras, or the car-mounted cameras. Um, so what we get as a result is up to the second things like street view, uh, street side, depending on which company is doing the uh, viewing of the street. Um, so it's not just something that's a couple of months old or a couple of year old. It'll be something that might be literally a couple of seconds old. So the stuff that's in the store window will be what was in the store window when you just looked at it right now. Okay, Really, really accurate, up-to-date information. Literally everywhere there are people who are wearing the cameras that are needed to do this, which means literally most people. You get, of course, on, in the large, up to the second world model. Okay. And that means that there is being built for the use of the folks that are building this and their clients really, really high resolution, accurate models of the world and the things that are in that world. Okay? And the really scary thing is, however, that if you like this idea, then 
you know, you wear your camera and you take pictures and you get information. If you don't like this idea right now, you could afford to simply not do Google searches or Bing searches. You can kind of live off the net. But if you walk around outside and anyone who's wearing a camera and is uploading their information is seeing you, okay, then maybe you have a Facebook page, maybe you don't, but there's lots of people who are going to be seeing you. And lots of times it's all georeferenced, all time stamped, and a complete history of what you are doing, you with your face and your clothes and your body, okay, is going to be recorded, okay, and potentially be used. And if you want to opt out, well, you might not benefit from it yourself, but People who are interested in what you are doing are going to get that information. So I think of this as being essentially kind of like the ultimate social network, but it's not a matter of you decide you want to be on Facebook or not. You're going to be part of this, okay, whether you like it or not. And I think that really scares me. On the other hand, maybe that's just because I'm an old guy and maybe there's a lot of young people here who think this is wonderful. On the other hand, maybe those young people in a couple of years will have kids and their kids are gonna, as they grow up think this is horrible and then the whole thing's going to cycle back and forth. I'm not sure. And at this point, I think it's time to end. I acknowledge my many students and colleagues that have contributed ideas to this. And for those people who are really interested in AR and have not gotten enough by being at ARE and want more, I uh, welcome you to uh, come to ISMAR 2012, the um, augmented Reality Research Conference being held in Atlanta, Georgia at the beginning of November. Thank you. Question for you. Yes. Um, do you really believe that glasses are the future of this technology? There are a number of other technology mm -hmm. areas where the holy grail is getting rid of the glasses. Uh -huh. A lot of user studies that support that. Okay. So I really believe that in the near term, whatever the hell that means, that eyewear is going to dominate things that you hold in your hand. Ultimately, I think getting rid of eyewear and being able to have other ways of being able to overlay things on my field of view optically and as well also my other senses, I think it's going to be very important. Some of that will probably get done at some point by means of implants, for example. And I suspect that there will come a time at which those folks who have been implanted will have kids who will then want to get the genetic modification that will replace the implant. In the same way that the parents that got upset at the kids that got the implants got upset at them, the parents with the implants will be yelling at their kids saying, I can always remove the implant. You know, it's not permanent. I didn't play around with my genes. Who the hell do you think you are, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure what happens after that. We become pure creatures of like light and form and, and <laughs> mentality, uh, and we float around in the metaverse. <laughs> yes? You sure you're not a sociologist? <laughs> <laughs> I have friends who are. <laughs> so, um, when, you know, this, this whole conference ends up being all these different pieces of the puzzle that mm -hmm. are just sitting right next to each other. You know, it's, it's really the same team making the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's all these different technologies that are uh, existing. And, yes. and really, this whole industry is going to, I think, benefit most if it's one cohesive net, as we were saying, like, you know, that the, all the images are being uploaded, all the information is available, or, or, or it's Fragmenting it is going to be the one thing that's going to really drive away from the profitability. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I think, unlike almost any other net thing, uh, this is really going to need and drive towards one unit that's running, kind of like the internet. Um, do, you, okay. do you see that as well? Do you see that 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 there there could be um, space for people running two different OSs essentially, uh, and, and having two totally different worlds of experience? Um, in the global augmented reality space? Or, or do you think that it might actually at one point just snap together as like an internet? Okay, gee, now you make it sound like the internet is this one wonderfully cohesive monolithic thing. It's running on so many different kinds of devices, running so many different kinds of operating systems with so many different kinds of displays. Yeah, right, uh, okay, so there are some things that are common, okay? And I'd like to think that some of the ways in which we will transmit information, you know, 4G is relatively common across many different, you know, phone manufacturers, Wi-Fi, there's standards over there, and, you know, we'll obviously build on top of them, and the more bandwidth we want to transmit. 
I, it's not clear to me we need to have one single operating system, that we need to have one single, many of these things, one single chip that things run on, one single kind of display technology that's used for even just head-worn displays. So I think having lots of things have their opportunity in the market is the right way to do it. Even though there are some cases, I can think of things like uh, beta versus VHS, um, the Sun News system versus X11, if that means anything to anyone here, in which I really believe the best technology did not win out. And if any of you know those, maybe you feel the same way. I like the applause. Uh, there's lots of things like that. Think about programming languages. You can find plenty of examples and, you know, some things work, some things don't work. Usually things win for a reason, even though you might want to argue they're not the right reason. And I like that open kind of market. What I wouldn't like is if there's zillions of different ways to get the information to you and they're all competing with each other and I don't think that's going to happen, right? I think people will standardize on the right things. Thank you. I think you might mean the infoverse instead of the internet. In a sense. Ah. Because the, the way I conceptualize mm -hmm. it is, is, is sort of non-denominational about technology or networks per se. Mm -hmm. Just the availability of collaborative information has been collaborated up to the cloud or some some place it's accessible. Mm -hmm. But it, you were talking about the implants. And it reminded me of the movie uh, called The Final Cut with Robin Williams. I don't know if anybody ever saw that. But you have to see it because mm -hmm. it's the seminal sort of life tracking, life blogging AR movie where a child is given a Zoe implant when they're born and then it's extracted after they die and then a cutter takes all of their life experience and makes a remembering, which is like a half hour, 45 minute slideshow of their life and videos of their life. And it addresses, that particular movie addresses a lot of the privacy issues and what if somebody did something bad and they got caught or it got filtered out of their, their implant or, or the like. And so there's a lot of interesting things in science fiction that here at this I conference. I agree, I agree. They, they've yeah. pointed at this conference a couple of different science fiction films and as examples of, of AR and, and things like we're talking about. But that's, some, that's one that people forget about. And... I've given a lot of talks where I've included that, and they were like, what movie was that? Mm -hmm. It's called uh, The Final Cut, and Robin Williams was in it, and it's, it's a pretty cool movie to look at. Okay, thank you. Thank you.